today for episode six, we're gonna go ahead and do something that we can have for dinner. Something that was actually King Arthur Flowers recipe for 2020 and it's crispy cheesy pan pizza. And we are going to make this again in our cast iron skillet. It's something we go ahead and make the dough ready the day before and it rests overnight in the refrigerator. I mean, it can rest 12 hours, but I'm gonna go ahead and rest it overnight and so that we will have our pizza tomorrow night for dinner. But before I start that, I think today you can see the shirt that I have on is again sort of going a bit away from my the music sort of theme. And it really is celebrating today one of my best friends, Marcy, and our time together and how long we've known each other. We've known each other since 1985, and she would be the first person I would probably call a best friend. Now, I have to be honest with you, I have a lot of best friends, so I have to be careful. I understand the meaning of best. It's supposed to be just singular, but you know, my mother served in the public library for many years. She was a public librarian. I served on a library board and the ALA had that campaign one year where they turned, you know, what do you geek? They you know, made a noun into a verb. So I thought, well, maybe I'll stretch the word best a little bit. So I have a lot of best friends, but this is the first best friend. So Marcy and I met in 1985. She was a year older than I was, and we met as roommates at Michigan State, where we went to college. And I think I have to back up a little bit and give you some context. I grew up in a small farming community, and I would say self-professed nerd, not intentionally. It's just how it went where I grew up. My interests didn't seem to mesh with the other kids that I went to school with, and it partially could be, you know, I'm still a big reader, I liked school, I was kind of, I was an introvert, and, you know, my mother wasn't, wouldn't buy into big social cultural things. So even though most kids took hot lunch at school, we took our lunch all the time, and one, one time, I remember this clearly in the sixth grade, that I went to school my lunchbox was one of those Shed's plastic peanut butter pails. That was my lunchbox. And I actually went to school as a young girl in the sixth grade with cow's tongue sandwich, a cow's tongue sandwich. You can clearly imagine that nobody certainly wanted to trade with me or sit next to me. There weren't that many people who brought their lunch. And it wasn't so much that, it's kind of like the blueberry thing, you know, where you're trying to convince somebody that it's like something. And it is true, it does taste like beef. It's just a textural thing that is somewhat disturbing. So I also play the saxophone. My parents wanted me to be the next Boots Randolph, another strange thing for a young woman to want, for her parents to want her to be. So, you know, I already had a lot of sort of marks against me. And I had curly red hair, much redder than it is now. And the kids used to call me Bozo in the school bus. So. You know, I kept wanting, I kept reading about all of these girls that had best friends and girlfriends, like, you know, Nancy Drew and Cherry Ames and Trixie Bell, and they all had these great, all those girl series of that time, and those were actually before my generation, but, you know, I still read them when I was young, and they talked about all these great girls and I, girl friendships, and I thought, geez, I really want that, you know, I'd really like that. This is even before, you know, dating that whole scene, I'm talking just those kinds of girl friendships. And it happened when I went to Michigan State. My first roommate was probably not, it wasn't her choice maybe to be in college, maybe it was her parents' choice. And she was my first roommate and I was on a quiet floor. I signed up for a quiet floor. And I'm not sure, I think her parents actually signed her up for a quiet floor. And she did not really, well she took to campus life, just maybe not from an academic perspective. And I needed to get a new roommate because I, couldn't wait to get to college. I wanted the whole experience, you know, classes, going to lectures, just the whole, the whole deal, right? And hoping to find my um, friendship tribe is what I was hoping for. And my first roommate was not it. Actually, so, I found my friend Marcy through a girlfriend, and another friend, not a best girlfriend, but somebody I knew on our floor who I had a class with. And I kind of, as I said, had to set you up for the time. It was 1985. Reagan was the president. The context of things was so different. And I grew up in a small rural community, but my mother and father were very open, let's just say. We were very accepting of, of everyone, so we had no biases as far as, um, we didn't have any biases, let's just say that. 
So this, the person that got Marcy and I together was actually someone who played for the Women's Football League in Lansing, and um, she was a lesbian. And it happened to turn out that she also knew Marcy, although we didn't know each other. I knew this person and Marcy knew this person, but Marcy and I did not know each other at the time. And uh, this friend said, hey, you know what? I know uh, another gal on the third floor. I was on the seventh floor. It was another quiet floor who was looking for a roommate and she knew that I needed to leave. So, because it was just really ruining my whole college experience by having a roommate that didn't, didn't want to any of the academic side. It was more of the play side. And, you know, I said, there's, there's a big balance to life, right? So this um, friend um, took me to me, to Marcy, and she wasn't sure what to expect, and I wasn't sure what to expect. And we opened the door, or she opened the door, and here we are, we have the same, now I don't even wear nail polish anymore, but, but you know, remember I'm in a freshman in college, I actually had nail polish on, and as did she, and it was the same shade. Now, then it might not seem that weird to you, but at that time that was pretty pretty crazy. <laughs> Considering neither one of us really wore nail polish a lot, and we had the same nail polish, it was very strange. So we took a moment to look at each other and it was like friends, best friends from maybe not that moment on, but pretty darn close. So we kind of like, yep, that'd be great. I moved in and probably like later fall in my freshman year in 1985, as I say, Marcy was a year ahead of me and, but we were, we have been best friends ever since. And I really wanted to celebrate today when we talk about memory and friends, there are people in your life that you cannot imagine your life without. It may be even stronger than a familial bond, but it's someone that has so intrinsic and integral to your life and their family as well, your, your families as well, that you can't imagine life without them, nor, did you, nor do you actually want to. So Marcy became my first best friend and it was all that that you know you read about and having a best friend and a girlfriend and so forth. And, and of course I had other friends from there, but that was pretty magical. So we roomed together for two years. We had a lot of experiences together. We've remained best friends today and we're well, you know, into our fifties. And the really the soundtrack for some of our college, you know, years together was really, you know, I just remember distinctly when Joshua Tree came out from U2 in 1987. And I was a sophomore and she was a junior. And that was sort of a soundtrack for really that latter part of the 80s together. And we have been able to see them twice. We did not go when, in 1987 when they toured. We couldn't afford, neither one of us could afford to do that. But we have since seen them twice in our lifetime and friendship as adults. We saw them in 2011 in the 360 tour where they were touring all of the stadiums and they had that big sort of claw-like, it actually looked like sort of an octopus kind of tentacles in uh, Spartan Stadium actually at the college where we first met. So that was kind of cool to see them as based on the fact that it was kind of a soundtrack and we were seeing them at the college where we first met. And then we saw them 30 years later on their 30 year tour of the Joshua Tree. So making that sort of full circle soundtrack from when we were in college and rooming together when that when Joshua Tree first came out in 87 and then seeing them perform it 30 years later and had this great visuals and backdrop that were really based on the Joshua Tree's words and lyrics was really cool to kind of bring things full circle for us in our friendship. The other thing that happened with Marcy is not only did I gain a, a best friend, I gained a second set of parents. And that's what I also really want to celebrate as we're going through this recipe is our parents as well. I love my parents, so it's not like they replaced my parents, but having having it through your life, and I also have not just best friends, but multiple second parents, I'd say. So I have to be kind of careful here. But her parents definitely became my second set of parents, and we would work, travel around spending time with her mom and dad. And they lived in New Jersey at the time we were in college. And then post that, even when we had graduated from college, we would do road trips in the summer to go and visit them for vacation. And then when we were adults and not living in the same state anymore, we would fly in to New Jersey. Let's say she was flying from Baltimore, I'm flying from Michigan. And if we were gonna fly out of, we'd, we'd make New Jersey kind of our Newark airport, kind of our, our post for flying out of somewhere. But we would go fly into New Jersey so we could spend time with her mom and dad before a trip and after a trip. 
Now, how many people get to say they do that? It was so cool. So we would go in and like spend a couple days before we flew out and we would, there were so many times where like she and her mom and I would just be sitting around the, the kitchen table making macaroni salad or just reminiscing and talking about just life and just families and things like that. And I've spent so many great moments at her mom and dad's and her sister's um, in their lives, I guess, have been so intertwined. And we were able to do two niece and nephew birthdays at bookending a trip one time when we were out there in New Jersey. So, you know, those are some great memories and those people are part of you in your entire life. They're now intertwined, they're not separate. And that's exactly what a great friendship is like because you gain, you gain everybody else into your world and it becomes part of your story. You're so intertwined and it's, it's bigger than loving someone. It's like your soul. It's like part of your soul that you can't imagine not having as part of your soul because they create you too. They support you and build you up. So if this is too saccharine for anybody, well, you know, sorry, but that's kind of the day it is today. And I was also thinking though about my own mom and dad and the lives of my friends. And when I was in college, we lived closer to where I went to college. And my mom and dad would always host the girlfriends and I for overnights, camp, you know, we'd have sleeping bags. It was like a girl's sleepover, even in college. So those were some great memories. And you know, my mom and dad were also so welcoming. It was so much fun to go and spend time with my mom and dad's with my, my girlfriends and being welcome there. And as I say, even, you know, sleepovers could be a joy into college years. So it's not just for kids. I think the rewards of it as a college student were just, you know, equally as, as, as broad as, as when I was a kid. So definitely, you know, great memories between parents and friends and just some great memories today. So I think we're gonna go ahead and make this crispy, cheesy pan pizza, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about our relationship. All right, let's go ahead and get started with this lovely, crispy, cheesy pan pizza. Like I said, King Arthur Flowers, recipe for the year 2020. For the crust, which we're gonna let rise overnight, but there are several sort of processes in between, it's gonna be two cups of unbleached all-purpose flour, three-quarter teaspoon salt, half teaspoon instant or active dry yeast, three quarter cup lukewarm water, and one tablespoon of olive oil. So we're gonna combine all of these things together to form a shaggy, sticky dough. So let's go ahead and do that first. Let's get started. It's gonna be our two cups of flour. I'm gonna shift this around a little bit. So our two cups of flour, you know, kind of another funny story from our rooming together was, you know, I don't know if they do this anymore, but this, these were the days when your, your father, apparently, I don't know why, you know, they were your parents or somebody was expected to do this, but in college, when we went to Michigan State, there were only bunk beds and that was a bit not as desirable. So it didn't give you as much active floor space. So I had a drafting table and we had, of course, our two desks in our room and a little sofa and that type of thing. But my dad made us a loft, which was a game changer for us because we could both, you know, maximize our really small dorm room space. So it was really cool because under part of the bed above in the, in the loft, I could have my drafting table. And such was it, was it that when I was rendering or doing something and I was maybe an overnighter, that Marcy would spot me and help me render overnight if I was having, then in reciprocity, she was a nursing student. She would use my vertebrae in some of her classes where she had to you know, go through the vertebrae and which ones they were and, and the, their numbers and that type of thing. So we had a very lovely re reciprocity as far as our, our schoolwork, so it was very cool. So I've got my lovely multi-measuring spoons out again. So I've put my two cups of flour into my bowl. I'm gonna go ahead and add three quarter teaspoon salt. And again, it's lovely because I actually have a three quarter teaspoon spoon. Remember my whole thing with the uh, three one quarter teaspoons? So we're gonna go ahead and do that and add our salt. And then we're gonna add a half teaspoon of instant or active dry yeast. Now, what's interesting about this, and I want you to know, is that you don't add the yeast to the water. You just mix it into the bowl all together. And that's how we're gonna do it. So you add the ingredients separately, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and add my half teaspoon active dry yeast. Open up a package here. If I can get it open. Okay. So a half teaspoon of active dry yeast. And that's not a full package, so we'll save that for later. And then I'm gonna go ahead and add my three quarter cup lukewarm water, not hot, not cold. And I did not add 
I did not add the yeast to the water ahead of time. So we're doing adding it all at once. I'm gonna use my lovely dough whisk that I brought out. It's an old friend by now. And then I'm gonna add a tablespoon of olive oil. So that's one thing that's unique to this pizza dough crust. And I should in all confession tell you that I have made this before and it is fabulous. It doesn't need a lot of toppings to be a delicious meal. So I'm gonna go ahead and add my tablespoon of olive oil to this. And then I'm going to combine, and I think what I'd said was it's supposed to be, you know, shaggy, sticky dough. So that's what we're gonna get it to that point. And it goes, I think I just flipped flour over the side again. You've seen me do that before. On one of our adventures for visiting Marcy's parents in New Jersey, there is, and we both like, remember when I told you that I really like house museums? I think it's one episode when I was talking about Manitoba and Russell Wright. Well, another great house museum is near where Marcy's parents lived, and it's in Morris Plains, New Jersey, and it's the Stickley Home at Craftsman's Farms. And I don't know if you're familiar with Gustav Stickley, but he was pretty, is pretty much one of the folks who were very involved in the, the American arts and crafts movement. So you've heard of arts and crafts furniture or craftsman's furniture. He was very instrumental in that. He had gone to Europe at the end of the 1800s, early 1900s, and really saw what was happening there with the arts and crafts movement and French Art Nouveau. And so he came back pretty fired up about that. And so the, his, home in stu or his home was there in Morris Plains, New Jersey. And I just remember one of our trips out there that Marcy and her mom and I just took a little, just one afternoon, just drove, it wasn't that far away, and we're like, hey, let's go there. It was a beautiful summer day. So that's a great um, designer's or artisan's house and house tour. If you're near there in Morris Plains, New Jersey, you need to, to check that out. It's really great. Great House Museum. It's also actually a historic landmark and was one of the America's Save America's Treasures. And it is shaggy, so don't worry about that. That is totally fine. And I know from having made it before that shaggy is how it should be. So you can kind of see it's a little rough around the edges, but that's okay. Oh, uh-oh. Okay, a little too too much on the showing. But anyway, you can see it is a very lovely show as promised. And as I've made this before, I know this is the correct way it's supposed to look. We're going to cover this for five minutes. We've been letting this rest for five minutes. It might be over a little five minutes. I was kind of actually off doing something else. And what we need to do now is take our, what do they call this, our bowl scraper. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to use this. We're going to grab the bottom of the dough and we're going to stretch it up over the top. Okay. And we're going to turn this, turn your bowl 90 degrees and we're going to repeat this fold and stretch, fold and stretch, and we're going to do it four times, okay? So now that we've done that four times, and it is called a fold by the time you do these four, reaching from the bottom with the scraper, pulling it over itself four times, turning your bowl 90 degrees, in the process of the four stretches we call this, in place of kneading, this is called a fold. So actually what we're going to do is we're going to cover this for five minutes more and then we're going to do another fold. And then we're going to wait five minutes and repeat and do another five minutes. So really we're going to do, this is our first, we will do this process three more times for a series of four folds, full four folds. So again, in five minutes, I'm going to go ahead and do that same process, turning the bowl 90 degrees, the whole nine yards. And by the time we're done, we'll have done this four times. I've gone ahead and done the four folds, and what we're gonna do now is cover the dough again and let it rest undisturbed for 40 minutes. After we have the 40 minute session while it's resting, we're gonna go ahead and then refrigerate it for a minimum of 12 hours or up to 72 hours. So what I'm gonna do is actually cover it and we'll have it for a dinner tomorrow night. So it's a Saturday, we'll have it tomorrow and Sunday, but we're gonna go ahead and let it just rest, you know, out here, I'll cover it for 40 minutes and then we'll put it in the refrigerator. And we will see you tomorrow for the second half. Well, we were about to get started with the final phase of this great crispy cheesy pan pizza. 
and it talks about you should get your dough out of the refrigerator after it's been sitting and about three hours ahead of when you're actually going to make your pizza. So I have taken it out of the refrigerator and I'm gonna do one thing to it, actually a couple of things to it before we let it rise again or just sit out in my skillet. But I have to tell you one thing that I didn't share yesterday is that there is a reason why I'm using the crispy cheesy pan pizza today in talking about Marcy, my first best friend. In that, when we were in college in the 80s, when serve, you, if you were on a meal plan, you would not, they didn't have a meal plan on, on Sunday nights. And so you had to get your own dinner. So short of one of those little, before instant pots, any of those kinds of things, you had like a little, I don't know what they were called, like a little cooking pot that had a spout on it too, that we would do macaroni and cheese in sometimes in that, and soup, yes, I know, but these were the 80s. But the other thing we would do is we would get pizza from this local pizza place called West Side Deli. And it was kind of a big deal in Lansing area at that time. And so on Sunday nights, that was a big treat, was to go and get West Side Deli pizza. And that's one of the memories we have. And so it's a great time to make pizza and remember that. Another thing that happened in 1986, and a lot of you will remember this, but 86, there were two events that happened. Now. I do have my 87 U2 30 year anniversary tour U2 shirt on today. So yesterday it was Michigan State, today full on U2 celebrating the Joshua Tree. But there were two other things that happened in 1986 during the time that Marcy and I were at Michigan State. One was Ferris Bueller's Day Off came out. And I remember at that time when the dorms we had were 12 stories high and there was a sister, there was a, one dorm had all girls and the other dorm had all boys and there were sister and brother halls. So you tended to kind of sit with your at meals, you would sit and gather and with your brother or sister floor. And, you know, we'd read Calvin and Hobbes and Bloom County and Farside and have cereal for dinner. But Ferris Bueller came out and I remember a group of us, brother and sister floor from the third floor and went and saw Ferris Bueller's day off together. And that was a memory I have loved of that movie all of this time. Now, does it play the same now when I'm in my 50s? I don't know, but at that time, seeing that movie with our brother, Flora, and other people from our sister, Flora, and of course, Marcy was there, it has stuck with me as one of my favorite movies to this day. And I don't know if circumstances or context would have been different, but it certainly has stayed with me all this time. The other thing that I wanted to tell you that was happening was 1986, it was Haley's Comet. So, I should tell you a couple of things about that. So Marcy and I were rooming together, and we had bikes. To see Haley's Comet at the Planetarium at Michigan State, you had to go, kind of like United Center was in Chicago, it's on the outskirts of the campus. You cannot walk there, and we did not have cars. So in the middle of the night, we rode our bikes to the Planetarium to see Haley's Comet. And just to tell you what a big deal this was, in a tub in my home office in an envelope with things from college, academic things, you know, awards, college, was my piece of paper that certified that I saw Haley's Comet in 1986. It is a valued treasure I have no idea what I'm going to do with it. I don't think I'm gonna be buried with it, but it was a pretty big deal in 1986 to ride our bikes. Marcy and I rode our bikes like in the middle of the night. Two young women, it was safe at that time, riding it out on the back roads to the planetarium to see Haley's Comet. So it was a pretty incredible experience and I think that's what good girlfriends do, right? They allow you to be your authentic self and be who you really need to be. You just be, you don't have to be anything contrived. You just, they just allow you, good best friends allow you to just be. And that's the magic of having great best friends. The other thing that's interesting that I'm reading right now that ties into this girlfriend and, and a lot, your friends allowing you to be who you really need to be, I happen to be reading and literally just started it this morning. I finished the overstory, which I think I told you about in a couple of episodes prior. But I picked up this morning, just as kind of a break, 
I picked up Glennon Doyle's new book, Untamed. And this is definitely ties into the story very well in that she is living her authentic life after living a contrived life of what she thought other people expected. And when you realize you don't have to be that, good friends, good spouses, good partners, when they allow you to be, just let you be and be who you are, that is such a magical time, a magical friendship, a magical relationship and friendship that I just think it was interesting that I happened to pick up this book this morning, literally Sunday morning, and started reading this and thinking about what we were talking about in friendships. And I just thought about how much I am lucky to have good friends that allow me to just be. So great timing on reading Glennon Doyle's Untamed. So let's go ahead and what we have to do with this dough. So what I'm gonna do is put in my skillet. Remember, I'm putting this, it's cast iron skillet pizza. So what I'm gonna do, I've taken my dough out. I'm gonna do one and a half tablespoons of olive oil and put in the bottom of my skillet. One and a half tablespoons. And again, I have that great half tablespoon. So that makes it a lot easier. So I'm gonna put one and a half tablespoons in the bottom of my cast iron skillet. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my dough that's been sitting. Now it doesn't necessarily rise. That's not, that's fine. You don't need to worry about that. So what I'm going to do is I transfer it to the pan and I coat both sides in the olive oil. So I put it down on one side in the olive oil and then I flip it and it's coated on the other side. So what I'm gonna do then is push it with the tips of my fingers and stretch it, kind of not so that it, it won't at this point touch the inside of your skillet, but it will. So what I'm doing is I'm just using my fingertips and pushing the dough close to the sides, okay? And it will start to resist. It talks about that in the recipe that um, it will resist and shrink back. That's okay, it says, and it is, it's okay. So we're just gonna cover it and let it rest for about 15 minutes. And then we're gonna repeat the dimpling, they call it in pressing. We're continuing to stretch and rest. So by the time we get to the final part where we put our some of our toppings on and we put it in the oven, it's had a chance to do that. So it will have a couple of rounds of me stretching it and resting. So I've done that. Like I said, I'm gonna cover it for 15 minutes. We're gonna repeat this again. And then we're gonna let it rise at room temperature for about two hours. I've allowed the dough to rest in the cast iron pan for those 15 minutes. And we're gonna go ahead and do the same process that we did. I'm gonna use the tips of my fingers and push the dough to the outside. And it's allowing me to do this a little bit better now because it's had a chance. You know, I did that first amount of stretching and then I'm going ahead and it is coming to the side. So that is great. So it's doing that, and I have to tell you though, I've got olive oil everywhere. You should see my recipe, and I've made this before, but for some reason today, and it's kind of impressive, I don't have an apron on right now. I guess I was feeling pretty carefree, which that should learn me. I've been getting olive oil everywhere, just like the flour. So anyway, I'm pushing it to the sides, okay? So it's now on my full diameter inside of my cast iron skillet, and I'm gonna let this cover it again and let it rest for two hours at room temperature. And the best part about this is what it says, once you, let's see, once you are done and uncovered after those two hours, it says, the fully risen dough will look soft and pillowy and will jiggle when you gently shake the pan. That's the best part, what a great descriptor. So I've got it to the edges on my pan, great. which is great. I'm gonna go ahead and cover it for two hours and we'll see how it turns out. It's been about two hours. They recommend 30 minutes before you actually put the pizza in the oven. You need to move your two racks, one about four to five inches closer to the top of the oven and one at the bottom, because you actually do two times in the oven, one at the lower rack and one at the upper rack to just sort of crisp up the, the cheese at the end. So we are gonna go ahead and put our oven on at 450 degrees. And I wanted to kind of tell you sort of one last kind of story. And 
Marcy and I, of course, tra we traveled a lot together and so forth. I told you about visiting her mom and dad and making time ahead of, you know, flying into New Jersey to leave from there. That's actually when we went to Paris is when we bookended those times together uh, with her family. Well, before we did that, and before cell phones were really prevalent, at least I did not have one in the late 90s, we decided to take a trip to Scottsdale, Arizona. And why might you ask, did we go there? Because Frank Lloyd Wright's Taliesin West was there. And as you know, big fan, artists in their studios, designers in the studios, this happened to be Frank Lloyd Wright, so it's architect home and studio. So we wanted to go, that was a particular reason why we went to Scottsdale, Arizona, and we did other things as well, but that was the leading for us was to go to Taliesin West. And in the late 90s, again, like I said, we didn't have cell phones. And we were using a timeshare, her family generously let us use their timeshare weeks off and on, and so we, we thought, wait, well, we used that to stay in Scottsdale. And we didn't really talk about, this was not a time where we flew somewhere and then flew together somewhere else. We decided to go to Scottsdale and fly separate. She was flying in from where she was. I was flying in from where I was. We never talked about how to rendezvous when we got to the airport in Phoenix. Never even talked about which airlines we were flying in on. Now we knew generally we were gonna meet about the same time. We'd worked that out, but never really talked about how we were going to come together once we were there. And the Sky Harbor Airport is quite large. It's an international airport. So we're at the airport and it didn't even dawn on either of us until we got to the airport separately, separate terminals, separate airlines coming in from different parts of the country until I heard my name being paged at the overhead sound system at the airport. And at the time, I still had my maiden name. And I remember being so surprised. It was more unique than it is now. I have a fairly common last name now, but it was fairly unique. And I thought, I wonder who's paging me? <laughs> well, that's how we found each other. At that time, there were white phones, courtesy phones. I'm sorry about that. White courtesy phones. And that's how you would find somebody at the airport. So luckily now, with cell phones, and flying together from somewhere that really made things a lot easier. And this was, was just a funny story about, I, don't, I have no idea now why we never talked about how we were gonna meet. So thank goodness for overhead paging systems. We found each other and we're able to go from there. We had to pick up our rental car and do all the nine bit business, but we ended up because of the paging system, thank goodness at the airport, having my name called throughout the Sky Harbor International Airport. So let's go ahead and get this pizza in the oven. For the toppings, when you first put this in the oven, it's actually just a couple of things. Three quarter cup mozzarella. I'm actually gonna put a full cup in because I like cheese. And then you cover the entire crust to the edge and it says dollop small spoonfuls of the sauce over the cheese, then sprinkle on the remaining mozzarella. And I have a little bit left in my package so I'm, it's at the end of the day, probably gonna be over a cup, but you know, it's cheese. Right so then we're gonna go ahead and bake the pizza on the bottom rack of the oven for 18 to 20 minutes. So this is where the two rack system comes into play. And the cheese will be bubbling and it says the bottom end edges of the crust are rich golden brown, which is true. Then we're actually gonna transfer it to the top rack and bake for another two to four minutes. And if you wanna put more toppings on than that, they actually go on afterward. So it's once it finally comes out of the oven, you put your toppings on. I do once I put my toppings on, although it does not say that I put it for a quick, like hot minute back in the top rung, just to kind of set things, but you really don't have to. It doesn't talk about that. And this actually don't need it. The photo is actually showing just a lovely mozzarella cheese with um, the tomato sauce. So we are gonna actually add tonight, at the end of the day, I'm gonna add just some mushrooms and I'm gonna add some smoked pepperoni from one of our favorite smoke houses in Meriden, New Hampshire. It's actually where my husband is originally from in New Hampshire. And we love the smoke house. Smoke house. It's Garfield's Smoke House. And we visit them all 
the time when we're there or we have his parents bring items back and forth, primarily smoked pepperoni, bacon, ham steaks, and smoked cheese. So everything there is fresh, it's local. We love kind of saying that we have our own kind of smokehouse, although it's not. We're just, we just, just you know, they're from an area where Chris was, was brought up. So we always visit them when we're out there or have shipments going back and forth. So let's go ahead and put our cheese on first. It's our mozzarella cheese. And my dough has become wonderful, kind of jiggly when you shake it. Pillowy and jiggly, like they had promised, you know, the, the promised descriptors that I talked about sooner, earlier. And then we're going to go ahead and put a half cup. It says a quarter to a half cup of mozzarella or a tomato sauce, but I do actually the full, the full half cup. And instead of dolloping, because I kind of make a mess with that, I'm just going to use my little, little mini spatula and kind of, you know, just put it over kind of evenly around the pizza. This isn't that complicated. You probably don't need to see this, but I just sort of put this evenly on the pizza. And it's only half So we have our pizza ready to go into the oven. As I said, I'm gonna put this in for the full 20 minutes until the cheese is bubbling, and then, you know, probably two to four minutes in the top. You can see that the pizza is now in its final two to four minute top of the rack transition, and it's bubbling and it smells delicious, and I know it's just gonna be absolutely fantastic. Look at that beautiful pizza that I have just taken out of the oven. I put a few of my own ingredients that I put on tonight was the smoked pepperoni and the mushrooms. You can certainly put on anything you want, vegetables, herbs, you name it. Additional extra interesting cheeses. The one thing we do need to do when we get it out of the oven is pull it away using a heat sensitive spatula. We need to pull the pizza away from the cast iron side because the cheese tends to melt and fuse to the skillet wall. So right now I'm just pulling the pizza away from the outside wall. Oh my gosh, it just smells so incredible. So we're gonna let that sit for a few minutes, cool down, and then we're gonna go ahead and move it to a surface that we can then cut and have for dinner. Oh my gosh, this looks and smells wonderful. I can't wait. You can see it's just beautiful. And as I said, simple, easy. You can add whatever toppings you want. You basically, it's a quick one day ahead of time. You can always do the 12 hour rest. I rested it overnight. Get it ready for dinner today. It's a very easy recipe, very easy pizza in your cast iron skillet. Again, another like the cinnamon rolls, kind of a one pan deal, which is great. So I'm going to go ahead and have one. I think it's hopefully cooled down enough, or if not, I'm going to you know, burn my tongue, but I will blow on it a little bit. By the way, I'm not going to eat this whole pizza myself. I am just going to have this one or maybe two pieces, but I am going to share with my husband. Mm. Mm. Mm -mm. Oh, wow. That is so good. It's good or better than any pizza you get out. I have to tell you, it's fresh. It tastes delicious. The crust is just right. It's not too crusty, you know what I mean? And it just is absolutely delicious. So when you may, are making pizza or whatever you're baking or cooking, send out those love letters to your friends and your family. For me, talking about my friendship with Marcy over a shared memory of this great pizza that we shared when we were in college has made her so, feel so much closer to me in this time of quarantine, I would say. But just reliving those memories is just so precious and it makes me look forward to all of the stories and adventures we still have in our lives.